It's now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, by 2017-2018, the government expects to squander over $0.10 cents of every revenue dollar collected by Queen's Park towards servicing your Liberal government's reckless and unaffordable debt. That's taxpayers' money, taxpayers money that should be reinvested in frontline health care, first-rate education, reliable roads and transit. Instead of showing leadership and taking decisive action, you're going to force hard-working Ontarians to pay more for a decade of Liberal mismanagement. So, Premier, what taxes will you raise on Ontario's families in order to service that debt and balance the books? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me uh, let me just say that we've been very clear about uh, the path to balance that we have laid out. We understand that uh, it's extremely important that we continue to constrain um, increases on uh, on wages, Mr. Speaker. We understand, and we laid out clearly that we were going to be looking at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario and making sure that they are working to the, the best advantage of the people of Ontario, and that's the work that Ed Clark and his uh, commissioner are doing, Mr. Speaker. But we also recognize that as the economic recovery takes hold, Mr. Speaker, it's extremely important that we make the investments that are necessary so that we can continue to create jobs and work with municipalities to make sure that, the, that communities grow, because the economic well-being of communities across this province uh, all is par are part of the economic uh, well well-being of the province. So we have laid that all out in our budget, then in our platform, and then in our budget Thank again. You. And that's the plan we're implementing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> back to the Premier. Premier, because of your inability to stop spending and reverse course, Ontario has half a billion dollars shortfall this year alone. Ontarians cannot afford any more money taken out of their pockets. They cannot afford new and higher taxes. On the issue of a carbon tax, your environment minister has said, quote, it's time for all of us to start to get comfortable with two words, carbon tax. Without it, all those dreams of, green of a green tomorrow are hallucinations, end of quote. So, Premier, straightforward question. Will you be introducing a carbon tax on hard-working Ontario families before 2018, yes or no? Well, Mr. Speaker, what we, are, what we are focused on is making sure that we do everything in our power to grow the economy, Mr. Speaker. We understand that balancing the, the books and making sure that the deficit is reduced by 2017-18 is very much a part of the task in front of us. But we also know that building on the success of creating over 500,000 net new jobs since the recession, Mr. Speaker, the uh, lowest unemployment rate since the recession at 6.5 percent, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that building on those successes is what we have to do if we are going to be successful over the next decade. And the investments that we're talking about that will ease people's commutes, that will make sure that communities have the roads and bridges that they need, the Thanks, hospitals sir. and the schools, those contribute to a quality of life that is critical to the economic and the social well-being of the people in this Thank province, you. Mr. Speaker. Final well, Mr. Speaker, it sounds like a yes to me. I think so. Premier uh, Laurel Broughton, uh, Laurel Broughton, sorry, a former Ontario Liberal Environment Minister and cabinet colleague of yours, is calling on the Nova Scotia government to introduce a carbon tax. Quebec implemented a carbon tax in 2007, and then became part of the Western Climate Initiative. In August 2014, you announced a strengthened relationship with Quebec on the issue of climate change. Your news release even quoted Premier Coulard as saying, we are looking forward to recruiting new partners among our neighbours. Well, to be a partner, you have to have a carbon tax. So, Premier, do you plan on joining Quebec and imposing a carbon tax on Ontario families? Well, Mr. Speaker, here's, here's what we're joining with Quebec on, and that is an acknowledgement that reducing greenhouse gas emissions and dealing with the effects of climate change is a, is a challenge for every single one of us. And the member opposite is the first to jump up, Mr. Speaker, if there is a tornado or if there is a flood or if there is a, a demonstration, an indication of the impact of climate change. So, on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we believe that climate change is a reality that we have to deal with. The member from Renfrew will come to order. Carry on, please. The most important thing that has been done in this country in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the shutdown of coal-fired plants in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So, are we going to continue to fight climate change? Are we going to continue to do everything in our power to guarantee that there is a world for our children in the future?
future, Mr. Speaker? Absolutely. You seen it, please? You seen it, please? New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, you know, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we can play the shell game all we want. A tax is a tax is a tax, whether you call it a carbon tax or not, Premier. Uh, Premier, during the uh, back to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker, Premier, during the last election, you called cuts to education dangerous for children. Mm. In fact, you said cuts to education funding were detrimental and have such a negative Deputy impact House on Leader. so many people's lives in this province that you would never support them. And yet, you're now planning to cut $500 million from the education budget because of your fiscal mismanagement. You claimed these cuts were dangerous during the election. Yet now your government is taking millions of dollars out of the classroom. Mm. So, Premier, this is just another case of you saying one thing and then doing another. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the fact is that our government has increased funding to the education system every single year we've and been in office, Mr. Speaker, and we're continuing to do that. We've increased education funding to $22 billion this year, Mr. Speaker. That's an increase of 56.5 per cent since 2003, an increase of more than $4,000 per student. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that we have made sure that the resources that go into education go into uh, to advanced student achievement, Mr. Speaker. We came into office and 68 per cent of kids were graduating from high school in this province. 83 per cent of kids are graduating from high school in Ontario now, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that at a time of declining enrollment, we have continued to increase funding to the education system because we know that that's how the talent and skills of our kids can thrive, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Again, to the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Premier, your former Liberal colleague and successor as Education Minister Leona Dombrowski said that, quote, the government believes locally elected school boards have sound processes in place to make decisions about school closures in consultation with their communities. And you've said similar things many times. Yet yesterday, your current Education Minister made it pretty clear in this House that you will not fund undercapacity schools, leaving the impression that the Minister will make the decision on which schools will close. So, Premier, which is it? Will individual school boards decide which schools will close, if any, or will you order the school closings yourself? Excellent. Well, in fact, what I heard the Minister of Education say was that we have to make sure that we fund the students and the places in the schools, the students that exist, Mr. Speaker, that, that we make sure that we work with school boards to maximize the investments in their, uh, in their school boards, to make sure that the programs that are available to kids are the ones that they absolutely need. I fully support, I've been a school trustee, Mr. Speaker, I fully support the authority of school boards to make decisions about program delivery to students, Mr. Speaker, but it is only responsible that we work as a provincial government with school boards. Something I might say the member opposite doesn't know a lot about, given their track record in government, but that we work with school boards to make sure that the distribution of kids Answer. is in schools in the best way possible and that we're not funding empty or half-empty schools, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I don't need any lectures after 24 and a half years yeah. in this House right. serving school boards preaching for good education and supporting good education. Right. Premier, as Education Minister, you said, quote, it would in fact be irresponsible. Stop the clock, please. Order. Please finish. As Education Minister, you said it would in fact be irresponsible for any government to tie the hands of local school boards to make decisions about their communities. However, by slashing half a billion dollars from the education budget, you're doing exactly that. Your Minister of the Environment, schools, come to order. Particularly in rural and small town Ontario, a done deal. Premier, very simply, when will you release the list of the schools you're planning to close? Excellent. Mr. Speaker, let me repeat. We are increasing funding to the education That's system. In the face of declining enrollment, we are increasing the funding to school boards. That's the fact. 
That is the reality. That is the reality that school boards are dealing with. Will we continue to work with school boards to make sure that uh, kids are getting the programs that they need, that there are enough kids in schools to make them viable? Absolutely. We will continue to work with school boards. Will we, will we work with school boards to help them to consolidate where there's an opportunity for school boards to work together? Absolutely. We will do that. I think that that is responsible management of the public dollars in this province. Will we continue to work with school boards to improve student achievement as we have done, Mr. Speaker, and we have seen student achievement increase? Absolutely, we will do that. Will we fund empty spaces yes, and will we, will we step back from the process? No, we will continue to work with school boards, Mr. Speaker. New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, yesterday, the Premier said, I quote, the reality is that we continue to put more money into education. But an internal document says that under the Liberal Austerity Plan, quote, the recent pattern of annual increases in education funding is no longer sustainable, unquote. Now, internally, the Liberals say that half a billion dollars is going to be slashed from schools. In public, the Premier is playing good cop, telling Ontarians that they are going to be putting more into education, and in private, she's being bad cop and saying that the well is dry, Speaker. Why is the Premier telling one story in public and another story behind closed doors? So, Mr. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Education is going to want to uh, weigh in on this, but let me repeat what I have said. We continue to put more money into education, Mr. Speaker, even in the face of declining enrollment. That is what we have been doing. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, the reality is that there are ways of school boards working together. And I'll use transportation as the, uh, as the example that is the farthest along, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that we have worked over a number of years, in fact, since I was Minister of Transportation to make sure that school boards have the capacity to work together and that they have the ability to have kids from different boards and different schools on the same school bus, Mr. Speaker, so that school buses driving down a particular road pick up kids and take them to a number of schools. That kind of cooperation, whether it's transportation or whether it's back office, yes, whether it's sharing buildings, yeah, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to try to work to find those efficiencies. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, despite the Premier's denials, internal documents say clearly she's slashing $500 million from schools. Now, as a former Minister of Education and school board trustee, the Premier knows that it's always the most vulnerable students who suffer the most from this, yep. whether it's school closures or cuts to special needs, ESL, school breakfast programs, libraries. Uh, and literacy and numerous supports or counselling services, Speaker. The bottom line is it's going to hurt students. Will the Premier commit to putting that half a billion dollars back into our schools where it belongs, Speaker? So, Mr. Speaker, you know, teachers, I mean, on so many issues, it is, uh, it is so dangerous to oversimplify and to to take a, a particular a particular notion and make extrapolate that across a whole issue the fact is that there are instances after there's a, there are many many instances across the province where school boards have made decisions about consolidating schools and the programs have improved those very students that the, the leader of the third party is talking about get better service mr. speaker get they get better opportunities they have more opportunities because of the consolidation of a school board or because the building of a new building, Mr. Speaker. And more times than not, when there's a consolidation of schools, there is a renovation or a new school built. So to oversimplify this issue, Mr. Speaker, and to somehow suggest that Answer. the fact that we're putting more money in education is a problem, I think is irresponsible. Final supplementary. Speaker, there's nothing simple about it. Slashing half a billion dollars from education is going to mean ripping schools out of some communities and overcrowding others. It's going to mean program, program cuts, Speaker. It's going to hurt the most vulnerable students in our schools, and this Premier knows that that's true, Speaker. The Premier created chaos in our school system with Bill 115, and she's creating chaos again with a five, or a half a billion dollar cut, Speaker, to schools. If she's not prepared to put the money back into our schools, will she stand up and tell parents and educators exactly what it is that she's going to be cutting from them? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. I think I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the funding model. 
uh, because classrooms are funded, as you well know, Speaker, based on the number of students. So the, the, the looking at boards and working with boards on can they operate the space more efficiently has nothing to do with the number of teachers or the amount of special, special ed money. That's all based on the number of students, and it has absolutely nothing to do with this issue. But what we do believe is that it's perfectly reasonable to work with trustees and say to them, uh, in, in terms of your operations, which is heating, lighting, Answer. space, we can work together to make it more efficient. That's all we're saying is good management, no matter who you Thank are, you. involves good management. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my next question is for the Premier. In health care, just as in education, before the election, we were promised that things would get better. After the election, we see things that are getting that things are getting very much worse. Speaker, today, Health Quality Ontario released its annual report, and they say, "quote Access to care continues to be a problem in many areas of our health system." Unquote. When Ontario is compared to ten countries, Speaker, including Great Britain and the United States, we come dead last, dead last when it comes to getting people in to see a doctor from Eglinton, when they're Lawrence sick. Come to yes, order. We even do worse than the U.S. Speaker. Wow. Does the Premier think it's okay that Ontarians want, wait longer to see a doctor than patients in 10 other countries? Speaker? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, the, the fact is we know that there is more that we can do. We, when we, uh, uh, we have been working to transform the, uh, the health care system, Mr. Speaker. There are uh, a number of areas where wait times have been reduced, Mr. Speaker, and we have made a lot of progress. But we also know that we're dealing with uh, an aging population that needs a different kind of service, that needs more service at home, and that's the transformation that we are uh, that we're in the, in the midst of. I mean, we're not proposing that we are finished with the transformation of the health care system. We know that there's more that has to be done, and part of that is getting the right services to people where they need them, whether that is, whether that is in a hospital or whether that is at home or whether that is in some other kind of supportive housing. So this is, this is an issue that is ongoing, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's more to be done, and we are investing in those changes in order to get Thank to you. those successes. Well, Speaker, during the election, the Premier said, quote, Ontario will be the healthiest place in North America to grow up and to grow old. But now that the election is over, uh, the Health Quality Ontario report, or the Health Quality Report rather, says that long-term care wait times for residents in hospitals have never been higher, Speaker. They're higher today than at any other point since the Liberals came to office, tripling from just 18 days in 2004 to a staggering 65 days. Under this Liberal government, seniors are waiting longer than ever in hospital for the long-term care that they need. Now, how healthy does the Premier think it is to have seniors waiting over two months for long-term care that they need? Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And you know, we, we welcome the, re the release of Health, Qual uh, Health Quality Ontario's report. It's called Measuring Up, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're committed to we're committed to providing the best patient care possible, and we have we have adopted. Uh, a process of transformation that has provided different kinds of service and has allowed people to get service at home in the community where they haven't been able to get it before. Are we finished? Absolutely not. But there are many areas in the report that uh, that show the successes that we have uh, achieved, Mr. Speaker. Measuring Up talks about the fact that Ontarians are healthier than they have ever been. So the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that the work that we are doing is actually providing services that people need, is providing them with the services Answer. that they've been looking for, and providing them in their homes and in the community where they weren't able to get them before, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Final supplement. Speaker. During the campaign, the Premier promised she'd hire nurses, not fire them. In fact, she said, quote, I'm not going to apologize for hiring nurses. 
But after the campaign, the truth comes out, Speaker. Every year for the last five years, we've had fewer registered nurses looking after our kids, our parents, and our loved ones. Ontario's Nurses Association President Linda Haslam Stroud uses words like, and I quote, appalled. Stop the clock, please. Order, please. It's better, thank you. Finish, please. When a President Linda Haslam Stroud uses words like, and I quote, appalled, disgusted, and horrified to describe what's going on in parts of this province under this Liberal government. Registered nurse positions are being eliminated all over Ontario, creating an appalling situation in this province. So I ask this Premier, Washington. will she apologize for that? Okay. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's let's talk about the facts. The fact is that we have hired over 20,000 nurses, Mr. Speaker. Let's talk about the fact that we've established 26 nurse practitioner-led clinics. Let's talk about the fact that we've got now 10 Aboriginal community health centres, 76 community health centres, 200 family health teams. Mr. Speaker, we have diversified the uh, the ways in which people can access primary health care. We have hired more professionals, and we have put them into uh, interdisciplinary teams, Mr. Speaker, that is delivering health care in a way that makes sense to people in communities across the province. That's why the Health Quality Ontario report is able to say that Ontarians are healthier than ever. We will continue to make investments and continue to transform the health care system so that it meets the needs of the people of this province. Thank you. Member from Dufferin Calvin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Repeated warnings about the structural problems at the Algo Mall in Elliott Lake were ignored by your government. On January 11, 2012, an inspector from the Ministry of Labour performed an inspection of the mall that, to quote Justice Bélanger, was perfunctory, incurious and inadequate. Premier, you've not apologized on behalf of your government for playing a part in the mall's collapse. An apology can go a long way. It can help speed up the healing process after a tragedy. Premier, will you apologize for your government's lack of oversight, which contributed to this tragedy? Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Labour is going to uh, is going to want to speak to the specifics. I just I just want to say that uh, we have said all along, and I have said all along, that my hearts go out to the community members, particularly to the family of uh, of the uh, the woman who was uh, who died in the uh, in the collapse of the mall. I'm very grateful. The two sorry the two the two people who uh, who perished. Um, I am very pleased that the report has has exposed the uh, the issues that uh, needed to have been dealt with mr speaker and i uh, i will let the minister of labor speak to the specifics thank you thank you supplement i think it would mean a great deal more if you actually went to elliot lake mm -hmm. and did that formal apology as you did with yeah. the other examples that we have in 2009, your government passed Deputy the Apology House, Act, which allows a person to apologize on a specific issue. The Attorney General at the time said this bill, quote, gives people the opportunity to have closure, to speak frankly in relation to an issue, whether it's a health care issue or a legal issue or some other matter, without having those comments that they're making used against them in a court of law. You have an opportunity to show real leadership and apologize to the people of Elliott Lake for your lack of oversight. So, Premier, when will you apologize to the people of Elliott Lake? Premier. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I, I think I can speak for all members of the House that we were all saddened when we heard the news of this mall collapse, and our thoughts and our prayers have been with the families ever since then. We'd also, I think, all in this House like to thank the, the Honourable Paul Belanger for, uh, for his work on this matter, for the report on this matter, for the recommendations he's made. All the ministries involved are re, uh, reviewing the report. We're working together. We're looking at the recommendations that are contained within it. Some of the recommendations that have come forward, we've already acted upon speaker so I know that the, the one engineer has been charged under the Occupational Health and Safety Act in relation to the mall collapse the individual was charged as a professional engineer for endangering a worker as a result of providing negligent advice and as a worker for working in the manner that may endanger a worker speaker we were all saddened at the news I think it's the intent of this house that yes, this sir. type of tragedy never happen again in the province of Ontario thank you in your question, the member for Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. 
Speaker, the Liberals keep saying they're being transparent. They say they're telling the whole story on Mars. Yet, on page one of the agreement that the Liberals signed with Mars, it says OILC has advised the borrower that its loan application number 11039, dated August 2nd, 2011, has been approved. But, Speaker, the actual application paperwork for the loan is nowhere to be found. Premier, where is the application? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Mr. Economic Development, Trade and uh, Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have. Uh, I, I, I've instructed my deputy minister to, to uh, release all documents that were requested, both during the time at estimates that I spent with the member uh, uh, and, uh, and requests from the media. And all, all requests of, for information have been released. Uh, Mr. Speaker, these loan programs, the application process is online, and if a request is made uh, to release uh, that application, uh, we're happy to do it. I've, I've actually seen the application. There's nothing in it you don't already have, but it's something we're, uh, we're happy to. Uh, I'm happy to ask my deputy minister to have a look at just to make sure uh, that it's something that's suitable for release. And if it's his determination that it is, be happy to release it. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, let's cut to the chase, Speaker. The Liberals have not released the business case for the loan that they made to Mars. You haven't done it. The loan, Speaker, by the way. They had to bail out in secret during the election, and now, Speaker, they're not even releasing the loan application yet. This government still hasn't explained why this multi-million dollar project, contingent on an 80 percent occupancy in order to be worth the investment, was allowed to go forward. What is the Premier so desperate to keep away from the public? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm glad the member modified his supplementary question to put the word yet in, because I just said yes to his request, and I'm not sure uh, why he would not take that as, a, as an answer. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've released all the information we've been asked to release, and lo and behold, Mr. Speaker, the information just confirms what we've been saying all along. Mr. Speaker, we've, we've made an investment by way of a loan that is 100 per cent secure to ensure that Phase 2 of Mars can continue and get built. It's been built. Mr. Speaker, now the key is to make sure it gets leased up. We've made, we've made an inter interjection in the, in the transaction by buying out ARE to ensure that that can now happen. I'm awaiting advice from Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson uh, to determine what next steps are, but they've told me that this project is not a failed project. Answer. Indeed, uh, with their advice, we should be able to get it back onto a positive keel. So, Mr. Speaker, I hope I have the members' Thank support. You. When we get to that point, new question. The member from Mississauga Street Hill. Well, thank you, Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, this week is Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week. In Western Mississauga, we have an outstanding school that's done some groundbreaking work in creating an open, supportive, and accepting learning environment for all students. St. Joseph's Secondary in the Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board won a Premier's Accepting Schools Award last year for its accomplishments in creating a gay-straight alliance formed by a group of students who wanted to connect in a safe space. In Mississauga, St. Joseph's has provided Ontario a template for excellence in a productive learning environment. Minister, what has Ontario done province-wide to help all students feel safe while learning? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And I'd like to add my congratulations to St. Joseph's Secondary School in uh, Mississauga for winning the Premier's Award. But uh, during this week, I hope that everyone will take some time to consider the issue of bullying and the role it may be playing in their lives or the lives of others. Every student has the right to feel safe and accepted at school. If the students don't feel safe, they can't be at their very best. So that's why I'm so very proud of our government's Accepting Schools Act. The act requires boards to provide supports for the bully, the bullied, 
and the bystander, and requires principals to investigate all reports of bullying. The government's invested over $425 million in safe schools initiatives that are helping make Ontario Answer. schools safe. We've defined bullying in legislation, and we are making great progress on the whole issue of thank bullying you. prevention. Thank you. Well, thank you, Minister. St. Joseph's schools, uh, <coughs> their work is led by its principal, Jeff Quenville, whom I've come to know and respect. In fact, Jeff himself is one of this year's award winners for building and accepting school climate. The administration and staff at St. Joseph's have developed a healthy and a respectful relationship among students throughout the entire school and in the surrounding community. When this House considered bullying in Bill 13 last year, it saw that repeated, persistence and aggressive behaviour directed at an individual or individuals does cause fear and distress. Bullying involves more than physical and verbal violence. It includes social and cyberbullying. Minister, how is Ontario addressing cyberbullying in respect to kids, computers, and cell phones? Good. Thank you. Minister? Yes, thank you, and thank you to the member for this very important question. Cyberbullying has been a concern of our government and the Safe Schools Action Team for a number of years. So that's why the Accepting School Act explicitly defines cyberbullying as part of its definition of bullying. If a principal believes that actions occurred online had a negative impact on the school climate, the principal legally has the authority to take action. Action. And Ontario is actually pretty unique in that respect because we know that when st students uh, bully each other outside of school online and come into the school, they don't feel safe and then they can't succeed. So we know that we need to have a way for, for principals and teachers to intervene in the science bullying and the life of the student so that we can ensure that schools are a safe and accepting place for all our students and that we will Thank not you. tolerate bullying. That's it. We have a question. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, municipalities are still waiting for the millions the government promised to help them clean up from last year's ice storm. They have yet to see a dime. A year My question is this. How many thousands of dollars that should be going to municipalities for disaster relief is instead being spent on consulting fees? Good question. Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question, and let me just uh, try to bring as much clarity to it as quickly as I can. Yeah. Our government, in response to some input from AMO and a number of uh, community, communities that were stricken with uh, um, difficulties, I think there were 53 that qualified, responded by putting in place a $190 million fund that could be drawn upon. We, we of course, uh, met with and provided training sessions uh, for municipalities as to how to complete the accountability paperwork that was necessary. They're working very, very hard at that. Uh, all of those sessions, by the way, were done internally by ministry staff. Uh, sessions were done. Municipalities are, are processing uh, uh, their uh, claims as quickly as, as quickly as they can. And, and, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say that, that as the paperwork Answer. comes in, we're releasing that money. <coughs> thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I didn't hear an answer there. Um, the Liberals hired a consulting firm, Landley Consulting, to manage the process, so far with nothing to show for it. Now the government is telling municipal staff to register for a two-hour-long webinar just to learn how to fill out the paperwork. Wow. Who's putting on the red tape webinar? Landlink. Who's in charge of reviewing the applications? Landlink. Who's paying for all this? Taxpayers. How much will it cost? The Liberals won't say. Does the minister really have so little confidence in his own ministry that he would sign a secret deal with a private consulting firm? Or did he do it to evade accountability like the Liberals did with eHealth and Orange? Minister? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, we just did a quick uh, check with one of my colleagues here around uh, consulting fees and just uh, adding to my answer. Uh, in 2001-2002, uh, uh, the Progressive Conservative, uh, when they were in government, invested $650 million 
in consultants in the last uh, three years, our figure is under $300 million. So we're, we're working hard to curb, to curb the hiring of, of, of separate consultants and doing the job in Toronto, working very hard with municipalities around their needs, something that government didn't do a lot of when they were in power. Thank you. <coughs> Any question? The member from Hamilton Mount. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government maintains that health care is not one of the ministries that will be cut by 6 per cent, according to their budget. In my community of Hamilton and Mountain, people are proud to be employed in health care, serving their neighbours who may need that care. Lakeview Lodge is one of those places. It allows cancer patients receiving care at the world-class facility, Jerevinsky Centre, to stay close by. They don't have to travel back and forth while they receive treatment that often makes Makes them very sick. There, they receive immediate attention by trained medical staff on site, unionized staff who can assess their needs and send them for emergency care at the nearby cancer center if they need it. But now, Lakeview Lodge is slated to close, throwing cancer patients question. out to find lodging at area motels. Speaker, my question is simple: Does the premier think this is acceptable? Thank you. Premier. <laughs> Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm happy to speak with the member, member opposite about this specific uh, situation that she's described in Hamilton. But the uh, the accurate response to this question, Mr. Speaker, is that we are making massive and significant investments in health care in our province, yes, we are. including in cancer care and right across the, the province, and including in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker, and to the point where Cancer Care Ontario and our cancer prevention and treatment support system in this province is seen as among the best, if not the best, in the entire world, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. That's right. So it, I won't deny, Mr. Speaker, that there may be a local situation I'm happy to speak with the member Answer. opposite to get a better understanding of precisely what her concerns are, but I think it's important that Ontarians understand the significant investments and what they're providing for the people. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, but I don't think the minister was listening. I was talking about the facility next door. So the reason that Lake, we're told that Lakeview must close is because of the freeze of hospital budgets in the last three years by this Liberal government. What the NDP and what many others have said is that all these cut are amount to cuts in our health care system. My constituents know and want what our non-union. We want to know what these non-union, non-health care cleaning staff are supposed to do when a cancer patient becomes sick from chemotherapy. Will the people in these motels know how to handle and dispose of it properly? Now these patients will have to take cabs and ambulances back to the hospital if they're urgent, where before the on-site nurse would be able to respond. Speaker, it's this government. Government's policies Question. that have shut down Lakeview Lodge. Is the Premier going to intervene to keep, to keep Lakeview open? Thank you, Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, this is a decision that was made by the local hospital, Mr. Speaker. And, and it simply isn't true to talk about a lack of investment in our hospitals when, in fact, hospitals' operating budgets in the last 10 years in this province have gone up by an average of 50 percent, Mr. Wow. Speaker. So we expect this in this particular case, as we would expect any anywhere in the province that the hospital and the Lynn that's supporting that hospital, that they will continue to provide support to any changes made to the housing of patients, whether they be cancer patients, Mr. Speaker, or other patients that are need, in need of housing support. So again, I'm happy to talk with the member opposite, but we continue to support our hospitals. The funding has increased dramatically over the past decade. Changes are being made as we transfer more of that support into home and community care so that individuals Answer. can appropriately be cared for as close to home as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Your question? The member from Burlington. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My Thank you. My, my question is for the head of Treasury Board. The Ontario Public Service has once again been chosen one of Canada's top 100 employers for 2015. <laughs> 
great news. I would like to offer my congratulations to the Ontario Public Service and, in particular, the members of the OPS who live in my riding of Burlington, who have and continue to serve our province with unflinching dedication decade after decade. I am proud to say that we have a dedicated and committed individuals in our public service. It is an honour and a privilege to work with them. Uh -oh. We rely on their advice, professionalism and expertise to help us make Ontario the best place to live, work and do business. They deliver vital services to our citizens in communities large and small Question. and help propel this province forward. Minister, can you please tell this House how it is that the OPS has been chosen and recognized once again with this great honour? Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the member from Burlington for this really important question. Speaker, this award is, it gives us a great opportunity to say thank you to the public servants in this province who work so hard for Ontarians every single day. Being seen as a leading employer, Speaker, is important to attracting and retaining the best and the brightest for the OPS. And it's not the first time the OPS has won this prestigious award. In fact, it's the fifth time that the Ontario Public Service has been chosen a top 100 employer in Canada. Transformation of our public services continue to move forward to change the way public services are delivered in Ontario, to give Ontario families the best possible value for money, and streamline access to the services that they need. We're counting on our public service to drive that change. Answer. Speaker, we have the best public service in the world, and I'm very proud to work with them every day. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. I agree, as I'm sure would every member of this House who has worked with the extraordinary, talented and dedicated members of our public service. We can't say enough about the important work they do and the significant contribution they make to our province. The OPS is instrumental in creating and implementing the policies and programs that Ontarians rely on, and we are thrilled that their achievements are being recognized and commended as a model employer. I imagine there's stiff competition amongst employers to be chosen for one of these awards, which I understand were announced in the Globe and Mail two weeks ago. Minister, could you please enlighten us on just how the OPS was selected for this honour and what criteria is used to choose the top employers? Thank you, President. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to uh, provide a little background. Each year, an organization, Media Corp, conducts research into the recruitment histories of more than 80,000 employers across Canada. Then they invite 35,000 organizations to apply for Canada's Top 100 Employers competition. So 80,000 employers, and we were chosen in the Top 100. Participants provide a detailed description of their operations, HR practices, including key areas such as the physical workplace, the work atmosphere, health, diversity, environmental leadership, assisting recent immigrants, charitable efforts, and community involvement. Winners are selected based on comparisons to other organizations within their respective sectors, and I'm delighted to say that Western University was also oh, chosen a top 100 employer. <laughs> Speaker, the OPS has and will continue yes, to lead by example, set the highest standards possible, and, uh, and for other employers to emulate these prestigious awards, acknowledge those accomplishments. Thank you, Thank you Speaker. New question, the member from Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question today for the Minister of Education. Minister, yesterday in a friendly Liberal question, you said, and I quote, by playing games, the opposition is delaying implementation safety measures for our children, end of quote. I know I've asked questions in this House, many of us have. We've participated in rallies across the province. We have asked for committee travel to Ontario's municipalities. I've met with the Ombudsman. We have started petitions in opposition to the flawed Bill 10. Uh, we will propose amendments to Bill 10. And finally, we have answered hundreds of letters and emails that your members ignored. Minister, we have done our job as the official opposition. You, on the other hand, have simply time-allocated debate and committee time on this very important yet very flawed bill. So, Minister, can you explain to the House and to the people of Ontario exactly what games we are playing, and will you stand in your place and do the honourable thing and actually apologize for such a rude comment? Minister of Education. 
Yes, sir, certainly, and I'm very, I'm, I'm very uh, proud of Bill Tan because what Bill Tan is for the first time ever, it gives, it gives our ministry, it gives my inspectors the authority to uh, deal with unlicensed child care violations. Now, I want to make it sure, unli clear, unlicensed ch home child care is a totally legitimate and uh, part of the child care uh, scenario in Ontario, and we expect it to stay that way. But what we do want to do is make sure that no matter what form of child care someone chooses, be it uh, a child care center, home care, either licensed or unlicensed, that every single form of child care in Ontario is safe. If people Answer. break the rules, my inspectors now have, or will under Bill 10, will have the authority to deal with it. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, she didn't say anything about us playing games. No. Minister, you proudly, and she, she said it yesterday in, in a friendly question. So, Minister, you proudly mentioned your Ottawa meeting last Friday. I know as a fact that participants from, uh, from the, the independent child care providers had no idea that you would attend that meeting. It was to be the Ottawa area M Liberal MPPs only. It was a surprise that you were in attendance. I guess you just happened to fly into the area. But let's face it. You kept it a secret from the public because you knew that it would draw a demonstration double the size of the 300-plus who rallied outside of your office in Guelph on November the 9th. That was the day you just drove by. So, Minister, who is really playing games? The official opposition or the Minister of Education who has not the courage to face and speak to people on a badly fought Bill 10? Minister. just demonstrated games playing. Some woman with brown hair in a brown car drove by my office. Has anybody ever seen me? I have white hair. That's games. However, I was really excited. I was really excited to be able to visit with home care providers and the uh, child care provider ne uh, research network in uh, Ottawa. And and uh, I actually think it's a great opportunity for me to be able to have a calm, private co a conversation where we were actually able to sit down yes, and discuss the issues. I actually think that's what a minister or any other MPP actually needs to do, which is to sit down and Thank calmly you. discuss issues. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, the gridlock price, uh, crisis is getting even worse in Thunder Bay Regional Hospital. There have been too many patients and too few beds over 85 per cent of this year. In fact, the hospital declared gridlock for almost four months straight this year. And every day that it operates, uh, 36 unfunded beds are being operated to meet the needs of the residents, Speaker. Beds that receive no funding at all from this Liberal government. Does the Premier think it's acceptable to leave Thunder Bay Hospital stuck in gridlock? Well, of course not, Mr. Speaker, and we're not leaving them to deal with this challenge on their own. In fact, I recently was in Thunder Bay and joined, in fact, by the uh, two members, the member from Thunder Bay Superior North and the member from Thunder Bay Atacokan. Great members who are very concerned about the situation of health care in their uh, localities, as they should be, and we're making important progress. And the hospital itself acknowledges and acknowledged in that meeting that we are making progress with dealing with the challenges that they are facing. And in fact, it was not that long ago this year, Mr. Speaker, that we uh, announced an additional $14 million specifically to deal with the challenges faced by Thunder Bay Regional Hospital, uh, the kinds of pressures that the uh, leader of the third party has. Uh, has indicated, and these, this additional funding specifically Answer. is going to support not just Thunder Bay, uh, the, the one institution, but the three largest health care providers, the Regional Health Sciences Centre, St. Joseph's Care Group, and Northwest Community Thank Care you. Access Centre, to solve these problems. Mr. Right. Well, Speaker, according to Thunder Bay Regional Hospital, it will take years for the gridlock problem to be fixed with the current level of funding that they're receiving from this Liberal government. The hospital says it is, quote, experiencing an erosion, an erosion of its ability to meet its acute care services mandate. 
That's a disgrace, Speaker. Thunder Bay Regional Hospital Deputy is being House stretched Leader. to the Last limit time. because this government simply will not fix the problem. Premier, exactly how many more years will the people of Thunder Bay have to wait for this Liberal government to fix the gridlock crisis at their hospital? Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we are fixing uh, the challenges faced by Thunder Bay Regional Hospital. Well, we, well, I know the member perhaps doesn't agree with this, but we are giving them precisely what they asked for, and that $14 million of funding, it's uh, helping them recruit up to 10 full-time and 14 temporary emergency room doctors yep. to improve access to urgent care, staffing 10 new acute care hospital beds to treat up to 600 more patients per, per year, Mr. Speaker, expanding a nurse outreach program to provide up to 500 more seniors and people with complex needs with home care, creating 26 new hospital beds to help more people with long-term illness or disabilities receive care, and funding up to 17 more spaces in supportive housing to help our seniors and people in need of care remain independent. Of course, Mr. Speaker, there's always more work to be done, but we're actually working Answer. in coordination and collaboration with the regional hospital, with the local MPs that I met, MPPs, Mr. Speaker. It's working. We're making progress. I hope that the member of the third party Thank you. realizes that. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, yesterday my federal counterpart from Ottawa South questioned the federal government on their commitment to the Ring of Fire. The question underscored its national importance. It was alarming to hear the federal minister of natural resources attempt to defend the federal government's absence on the development of the Ring of Fire. Mr. Speaker, all members of this House recognize the importance of the Ring of Fire to Ontario's economy and understand the development is a project of national significance. Yeah, Will the Minister of Northern Development Mines please share how our government is stepping up to the plate and showing real leadership in the absence of the federal government who would rather be on the sidelines? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for Ottawa South. Good question. I will acknowledge that I was startled, if not somewhat irritated, by the stunningly inaccurate statements or comments that were made by uh, Minister Rickford in the House of Commons yesterday. So let me once again just be very clear about our absolute commitment to the Ring of Fire as we are leading the, to drive development in that extraordinarily important economic development opportunity, despite a lack of any similar commitment from the federal government. We've been absolutely clear in our $1 billion commitment to develop transportation infrastructure. We have established a Ring of Fire infrastructure development corporation, and we're working with our partners to move that forward, and we've reached an historic framework agreement with the Matawa First Nation. Speaker, when the federal government says they're waiting for us to demonstrate that this is an actual priority, that is nothing but an excuse, Answer. an excuse for their complete lack of commitment. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has made it clear the Ring of Fire is indeed a priority for our government, highlighted in our most recent budget and last week's fall economic statement. The Ring of Fire is an incredible opportunity for communities across this province and across Canada. And while I appreciate the words of encouragement, we'd all be farther ahead if they directed them towards their federal cousins. Here, here. The Premier has made it clear that our government is committed to leading the way on this project with mineral potential up worth up to $60 billion. Can the minister please share how our government recognizes the need to work collaboratively with all parties Question. when it comes to infrastructure development in the region. Thank you. You know, Minister. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the heckling from the, uh, from the other side of the House is pretty interesting because I think it shows their embarrassment about the fact that they're not willing to stand up the federal government. To make sure they're going to we understand how important the infrastructure is in terms of the access to the Ring of Fire. And the Development Corporation itself stand is a rather significant step toward building it. We're working very very closely with First Nations. We're working closely with industry and we're working with communities across the province so that we can find the best way to tap into this extraordinary potential of the Ring of Fire. We are going to continue to move forward with the support of the Premier and all those on this side of the house to make sure that this project moves forward. It's time the federal government stepped up to the plate with their funding so that we can signal that not only but Canada is actually open for business. Thank you.
Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Start the clock, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Haldeman Norfolk. Speaker, to the Minister of Health, I'm uh, proposing legislation to better enable Ontario to deal with emerging infectious diseases, West Nile, Lyme, Ebola. There's, uh, there seems to be much work to be done on many fronts. Diagnosis, treatment, prevention. Treatment of Lyme disease, for example, is fraught with conflicting medical, scientific, political, social dimensions, disputes that are uh, long overdue for resolution. Social media has been accused of politicizing the issue, communicating inaccurate information, pitching dubious, uh, sometimes expensive treatment. There's also allegations of shortcomings in the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme directed at uh, mainstream medicine. Minister, we have government for a reason. Are there uh, no adequate mechanisms in place to deal with some of these disputes? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true. There are many measures, policies, and procedures in place. Uh, in fact, the uh, member, member opposite knows not only that this government and my ministry is committed to protecting the people of Ontario from vector-borne and zoonotic diseases, but we have effective policies and programs for all of the items that the member opposite mentioned. Surveillance, uh, prevention, control of zoonotic and vector-borne diseases, including promoting, importantly, the public awareness uh, of these diseases and also emergency preparedness. And I appreciate the timeliness of the uh, members, private members' bill because of the preparations that have been underway for quite some time in terms of Ebola preparedness. But you can appreciate, Mr. Answer. Speaker, being a public health specialist myself with significant expertise precisely in these areas. That these, you know, I looked at these policies and procedures and I look at them with great scrutiny, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy thank to you. Uh, continue in the supplementary. Two supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Minister. Uh, over the past several months, I've uh, developed legislation attempting to use a neutral, objective, science-based, research-based approach to emerging diseases like Ebola and Lyme. Uh, I am calling on your ministry to legislate a uh, provincial framework, an action plan encompassing surveillance, educational materials, as well as guidelines for prevention, identification, diagnosis, treatment, and management, including emergency preparedness and sharing best practices. The private member's bill comes up this afternoon. It mandates research, as well as collaboration, consultation with all concerned, and in particular with the, uh, the public. Not many people know what's going on. They get information from websites and CNN, but there's Question. a bit of a gap. So, Minister, there presently is no legislation requiring all of this. Are there any reasons why uh, you would not support such an approach? <clears throat> Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh uh, I welcome the private member's bill. In fact, I'll be participating in the debate later this afternoon uh, about it. Uh, I, don't, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I will be supporting the bill this afternoon. And, uh, but I do want to say, just so there's no confusion or anxiety out there, Mr. Speaker, that every, uh, part of the reason, largely the reason I can support it, that is because everything that Bill 27 is proposing is already in place to protect the people of Ontario from vector-borne and zoonotic diseases. But I sincerely want to thank the uh, member from Haldeman Norfolk for bringing this forward. I'm looking forward to the discussion and the debate, and quite frankly, we can always do more. So our government is very open to having discussions on how to continue to improve the surveillance and the prevention and control of our vector-borne and zoonotic uh, diseases. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, the latest report from Ed Clark says there is a market for the Ontario Power Generation's access like the smaller hydroelectric stations in Niagara Falls. Despite how, how important they are to the Niagara region and their place in the city of Niagara Falls, the latest from Ed Clark implies they will be selling these stations to private buyers. Can the Premier elaborate 
on Ed Clark's report and tell the people of Niagara if the government is planning on selling their hydroelectric stations? Mr. The simple answer is no. Thank you. Supplementary. Simple answer from the simple minister. Time's ticking. Now I. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how much time I got left to figure this out, so I'm good. Very much. But, but I, but I, but, but I am going to ask the last part of the question, just so so we can get that no more than once. <laughs> once I, once again, I'd like to know if the premier is intending on selling these stations, and if so, when will you're planning on consulting with the people of of Niagara? And I'd like to hear that. Answer again. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Minister of Energy. I'm going to say it very simply again no. Now we get to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> no question, the member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister, if you were to drive down a street in my riding, it wouldn't be unusual to see farms and fields on one side of the road and subdivisions and box stores on the other side. That's because Halton is one of the fastest growing areas in the country. In fact, the town of Milton has been the fastest growing municipality in Canada for close to five years. But with that remarkable growth in such a short period of time comes congestion, traffic jams and infrastructure challenges. These challenges put undue stress on people's lives and our economy. Investing in infrastructure is one of the most important things we can do to improve our quality of life and jumpstart our economy so communities can move forward. I know that as part of the 2014 budget, our government created an infrastructure fund for small, rural and northern municipalities. Mr. Speaker, Question. can the minister please update the House on this new roads and bridges fund? Thank you. Minister and rural affairs. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That truly was a very impressive question for the member from Halton. I thought so. And I might add that my brother and sister-in-law are actually residents of the member. They live in Milton, Ontario. And, and Gord Krantz, who just got elected again, is one of the outstanding mayors in, in Ontario. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we have a 10-year economic plan that's investing $130 billion in infrastructure investment, making communities in the Halt region grow each and every day. And a key step in our 2014 budget is the delivery of the $100 million infrastructure program for James Bay at Northern Municipalities. We built that program in cooperation with the Rural Ontario Municipal Association, the, the uh, Association of Roba, and all those partners to make this a great success. And the member from Halton is doing an outstanding job Definitely. in getting those investments in her community in the region of Halton. What are the outstanding areas? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, member, the member from uh, uh, Goma, Manitoulin, has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, introduce a good friend of mine, Karen Cameron, who's the executive director for the Independent School Bus Operators Association. I look forward to having lunch with you along with our critic. Uh, Thank you. And discuss business. I better acknowledge this one. The president of the church she board. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Speaker. And I, although I introduced them earlier, they weren't right here. So if everyone could just turn a wave at my dad up in the oh, hey, gallery boy. there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I could have taken bets on some kind of comment. Anyway, uh, thank you for that warm welcome of our visitors. 
We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 15, an act to amend various statutes in the interest of reducing insurance fraud, enhancing tow and storage services, providing other matters regarding vehicles and highways. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? On November the 19th, Madame Mel, you moved the third reading of Bill 15. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Balkasin. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Verniel. Mm -hmm. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. Elliott. Mrs. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. <laughs> all, those, all those opposed, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the court. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Harvath. Ms. Harvath. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Van Toff. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. 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 Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 71, the nays are 18. <clears throat> the ayes being 71, the nays being 18, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture de projet de loi. Be it now resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>